So let's say you're the leader of a country or you want to be one in the future. You've grown sick of all these checks and balances and limits of power and being held accountable because of the simple fact that you want more power. Because with more power comes more money, more freedom of movement. Basically, you just want to bring back the good old days of kings and queens and the royalty that comes with it. But unfortunately today, with crowds and the working class having more power and influence than ever, it looks like you might be at their mercy. Unless you know how to control the population, of course. We need to learn how to maneuver around the population to get them to submit to our rule without them ever even realizing it. We need to learn how to be the puppet master. And what better example to learn how to master the skill from than the world's second greatest superpower, China. Voices like these from Chinese citizens are very rare. People who are willing to speak out about the government's attempts to control news about the deadly crisis. Accounts or messages like these calling for free speech are quickly scrubbed from the internet. Or videos like this. Posted online one day, but gone the next. We the enemy of the state is information. After all, all of our opinions, decisions, and sentiments are based on the information we have available to us. Therefore, it only makes sense that if you control the flow of information, you control the population. That's why controlling the narrative is so important to China. But it is my experience that when the people ask questions that are not in their own best interest, they should simply be told to keep their minds on their labor and leave matters of the state to the state. And since we live in the age of information, the best medium to control the narrative is, of course, the internet. Controlling the internet is so important to China that not only do they have an entire division of the government dedicated to it, but they have an entire industry of auditors, as they like to call it, that's absolutely booming. Combine that with the infamous Great Firewall of China that blocks all major Western social media and search platforms like all Google apps, all Facebook apps, YouTube, WordPress, Blogger, Bing, and much more, and replaces them with government control alternatives, China is the king of censorship. The researchers I mentioned before called the Great Firewall the largest selective suppression of human communication in the recorded history of any country. But here's where you run into a problem. If you're too aggressive with censorship, obviously blocking content or certain words or phrases, throwing ordinary people in prison for talking bad about the government on top of the many journalists that you've already thrown in prison, it will eventually backfire. People will wonder why you're trying so hard to censor a certain topic or event. Is it really that big of a threat to the state? Hmm, maybe the government isn't as strong as I thought it was, which will inevitably lead to your downfall. That's why we need to be a bit more sly with our censorship, to not be so obvious about it. Allow people to criticize the government to give them the illusion of free speech. But the moment people start mobilizing their community for protests or rallies to take action on those criticisms, or they start calling out specific government officials, then crush them. The troops have been firing indiscriminately, but still, there are thousands of people on the streets who will not move back. Indeed, it was hard at times to grasp that this army was launching into an unarmed civilian population as if charging into battle. With this strategy alone, you kill three birds with one stone. Your subjects have the illusion that they can voice their opinion, you prevent any actual freedom of speech from occurring, and since you control the internet providers in your country and monitor everything people do online already, you get to monitor your subjects' needs, wants, and opinions. Basically, you get to check the pulse of your population. Instead of just censoring things online that you don't like, you can use the very clever Chinese tactic of flooding. Keep the unfavorable news articles online, but flood the search results and comments with conflicting information and opinions to create an ocean of contradictions. And the average citizen would think the facts are just too muddy, too complicated to ever know the truth. Instead of outright blocking websites, use people's impatience to your advantage. Make the website a little bit slower to load. Block a website for only a small portion of the population. Oh, there's a protest going on, you say? Make your government-run chat app 
have WeChat lag in that area. The goal of this is not to stop the spread of information, but to slow it down to where the average citizen will be too impatient to wait it out. This is called friction. It's both harder to see happening and scary effective. But even if you're able to master the art of controlling the narrative, it will be hopeless without the next piece of the puzzle. We just talked about some pretty drastic measures in the eyes of the populace. Systematic censorship, throwing journalists in prison, shutting down protests and rallies. How have people not gotten up in arms already? How did this seven word tweet bring the multi-billion dollar NBA down to their knees, asking for the Lord, I mean China's forgiveness? Why does Marvel enthusiastically censor their movies for the Chinese market? One word, leverage. If you're a US company and you want access to China's 1.4 billion people to sell to, you're gonna have to kiss the ring. You're talking about a one-party state that has the ability to let you in, to expel you, to make you rich. China is able to block such powerful and useful websites like Google and Facebook because they offer Chinese startups the incentive of less competition. And the Chinese population end up getting much or less a similar app that's catered to their culture. And its citizens are put in a similar position. Sure, we don't have too much freedom of speech and the government is watching us 24 seven, but things have gotten so much better over the years. That's not too bad. Sure, things could be better, but our GDP per capita, average income and overall quality of life has improved so much over the last 25 years that you know what, it's okay for now. If you want to heavily control your population, if you want to be the puppet master, you better have some leverage over your subjects and give them a good reason to comply because using straight up fear causes too many problems these days. If you don't, you can kiss your power goodbye. And if you're thinking to yourself, but Jake, man, this sounds kind of hard. To that, I would reply, yeah. That's kind of the point, because if it was easy, every country, every leader would do it. Remember the long-term vision. We're here to build an empire of subservient subjects. It will take some time. So take a deep breath and let's move on to the next key into the hearts and minds of the population. People always say they want massive change. Hell, they'll even campaign behind people who shout at the rooftops for massive change. But in reality, people despise change, especially when it affects them personally. Therefore, if you want to implement these massive moves like systematic censorship, throwing journalists in prisons, shutting down protests and rallies, everything that we've been talking about, instead of trying to do it all at once, you want to take it inch by inch, push people to the very edge of what they're comfortable with, and then go just an inch past that. Then hold back. Create the illusion that this is just a small but necessary change that's in their best interest. Once this becomes the public's new normal, rinse and repeat the process, and before you know it, you've put push people miles past where they were without them even noticing how far they've strayed. Things get to terrible places one tiny step at a time. If I encroach on you and I'm sophisticated about it, I'm going to encroach right to the point where you start, start to protest. Then I'm going to stop. Then I'm going to wait. Then you're going to calm down. Then I'm going to encroach again. And I'm just going to do that forever. Start with just a teeny tiny bit of censorship. Claim how many lives it will save, how much better society will be because of it. After this level of censorship becomes a new normal, move for another inch of censorship, then gain control a little bit more of the narrative. And before you know it, you're on the same level of China. Do the same thing with surveillance. Slowly add more cameras to the streets. Frame surveillance as not a dystopian tool for Big Brother to watch over you, but as the temptress of bleeding edge convenience like they do in Shenzhen, the Silicon Valley of hardware. Try to jaywalk in certain parts of Shenzhen and the government's facial recognition will spot you. There's even a board of shame showing the faces of recent offenders. It's already started tracking behavior as part of a plan to rank citizens and measure how good and obedient they are. Even though the strategy takes more time, the benefit to it is that your intentions fly right under the nose of the public. If you do it right, no retaliation, no protest, just compliance. But if you really want to move more like a few miles at a time instead of just a few inches, there's one big exception to this rule. There's a saying in politics, never let a good crisis go to waste. Crisis are a gold mine. After 9-11, the US population and even people in the government were put into absolute fear and all they wanted was for someone to stand up and do something about it to make them feel safe again. And the man that took advantage of this? None other than Dick Cheney. Uh, and so everybody just went, I don't care who does it, 
stop it. And they said this to Dick Cheney, which is a historic mistake, because Dick Cheney knows how government works. Dick was a pretty clever guy. You could even go as far as calling him a master at this game of power. See, he uses cry for help this feeling of fear to put together the most intruding surveillance programs ever seen in US history. Is it pathetic compared to China's? Yes, but compared to where the US was before 9-11, it was a huge accomplishment and a prime example of how you should take advantage of a crisis. But Dick didn't stop there. He wanted to milk this crisis for everything it's got and on top of his surveillance accomplishments, he profited very handsomely off of the war on terror, leaving office as the most powerful vice president in US history. Now whether or not you like him or dislike him is irrelevant. The lesson is, if you want to tighten your grip on your population faster, don't let a crisis go to waste. Is when we become fearful, uh, we become vulnerable to anyone who promises they will make things better, even if they have no ability to make things better, even if they will actively make things worse. But if they tell you, that they'll make things better. Uh, and you believe them in a moment of fear uh, that, that typically leads to unfortunate outcomes. And now for the final and arguably most important piece of the puzzle. The culture of a society is the root of everything. The culture of your population is what's going to allow or prevent you from gaining the power you need. See, what people don't understand is that it's not the laws and institutions that influence the crowd. It's the crowd's culture that allows for the laws to be passed in the first place and for the institutions to act as they do. Or in other words, if you want to be the puppet master, you have to create a culture that is receptive to your puppet strings. This is by far the hardest part of the equation because changing a culture takes time, which can be sped up with a crisis, but you get the point. Luckily for China, their culture has already been rooted in the family for generations, where elders are supposed to be respected and followed without question. Respect your elders. Compare that to Western culture that's more rooted in the individual instead of the family. This leaves the Chinese government in the perfect position to fill that void as the nation's elder for its children to follow without question. It's why Chinese companies are not only willing but want to help out the government with censorship and surveillance. Uh, Culture is what makes them feel pride when they do it. If you're able to solve this problem of culture, everything will fall into place with so much less friction because all the power, censorship, surveillance, leverage, and puppet strings will just be an inevitable downstream of the culture you created. Welcome to the Watch the End Club, and if you enjoyed this more controversial video essay, please consider subscribing because it's free and you can dislike and unsub whenever you want because I make video essays like this every single week on the most provocative stuff in the world of business. If you want to support this channel financially, completely optional by the way, being that you're stuck at home right now for obvious reasons, you might as well make the most out of that time by learning how to land a remote job so that in situations like this, you are perfectly fine. That is how I got my start in this whole make money online thing by landing a $40 per hour remote rub dub job and I firmly believe motherfucker and I firmly believe that this is the most practical path out there compared to all the other methods being promoted. So if you think that would interest you, check out the course I made on how to go remote with the link in the video description for a very accessible price. That's all I got for this video. Thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome. I've been Jake and I'll see you guys in the next one.